Dodgers legend Tommy Lasorda called it blue heaven on earth. It has its very own zip code. It's the only stadium in the world that's named after its fans. It's been featured in countless hit movies. The biggest musical acts in history have performed here. The Pope held mass here. It was inspired by Disneyland. It hosts more baseball fans per year than any stadium on the planet. It has the most iconic stadium food in the world. The most memorable home run ever hit in the World Series was hit here. It's where the stars of Hollywood go to watch the stars of Major League Baseball. It's where the high five was invented. It has a secret Japanese garden. There's a secret time capsule buried at the top deck. It's so much more than just a ballpark and you're going to impress your friends and family the next time you're at a game because you're going to know the secrets of Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium is named after the Dodgers, and they're one of just eight teams that don't have a corporate sponsor. But the Dodgers weren't always the Dodgers. Did you know that before they were the Dodgers, they had several different names? They started as the Brooklyn Baseball Club, then became known as the Bridegrooms after most of the team got married in the offseason. Then they went as the Superbas, then the Robins after their manager's last name, Wilbur Robinson. Then in 1932, they became known as the Dodgers. Now, where the name Dodgers come from? Well, if you were making your way to Ebbets Field in Brooklyn, you had to dodge the trolleys on your way to the field as a fan. If you were successful, you got to enjoy the game. If not, well, hopefully you ended up in blue heaven. And fun fact, the Dodgers are the only team in professional sports that are named after their fans. Now, a lot of people wonder, why did the Dodgers pick Chavez Ravine as the site for their home ballpark? Well, back in May of 1957, Los Angeles representatives were trying to get Walter O'Malley to choose Los Angeles as a relocation destination for the Dodgers and during a helicopter tour O'Malley was shown the land and he immediately envisioned the freeway access from all directions. Also, O'Malley considered the proximity of the stadium to Hollywood. He wanted Hollywood stars to attend Dodger games and he also wanted you to be able to see the Hollywood sign from Dodger Stadium which you can from the top deck on a clear day. Now when they began and the construction of Dodger Stadium, the elevations at Chavez Ravine range from 400 feet to 700 feet above sea level and more than 800 million cubic yards of earth was moved to reshape the area. And Dodger Stadium would become the first sports structure in history to be built on numerous levels, each connecting to an adjacent parking lot and eliminating vertical climbing designed for maximum comforts of the public. It was also the first privately financed stadium since Yankee Stadium that was built by a brewery in 1923. And here's a fun fact. They originally intended Dodger Stadium to be a drive-in stadium. Hey, you basically spend more time in the Dodger Stadium parking lot than you do in Dodger Stadium when you go to a game. So, hey, might as well catch the game from your car. The first game in Dodger Stadium history was played on April 10th, 1962. Left-hander Johnny Padres made the start against the reigning world champion Cincinnati Reds. Kay O'Malley, wife of Dodger President Walter O'Malley, threw out the ceremonial first pitch to catcher Johnny Roseboro. In 1962, the most expensive seat at Dodger Stadium was $5.50. And this year, the Dodgers had the most expensive average ticket price in all of Major League Baseball at $115. And back in 2017 for the World Series, dugout club tickets were ranging from $7,500 to $25. Now, I know for a lot of you, Dodger Stadium is the happiest place on earth. Well, did you know that it was inspired by Disneyland? <laughs> Legend has it that when the stadium was being built in the late 50s and early 60s, Dodgers owner Walter O'Malley, who was pals with Walt Disney, paid a visit to Disneyland, and he was so blown away by the futuristic look of Tomorrowland that after the visit, he met up with the stadium's chief architect, Captain Emil Prager, and started plans on the dynamic design.
design. Walter O'Malley even sent Dodger Stadium personnel to visit Disneyland during the development of the stadium and told them that, quote, Disney was the model. The original Dodger Stadium plans even had a monorail just like Disneyland. And because of O'Malley's friendship with Disney, the Dodgers are one of the few organizations in the world that are allowed to use the iconic Disney font free of charge, and you'll notice the recognizable font on the Dodger Stadium welcome signs. Now, when Dodger Stadium first opened in 1962, they were competing with Disneyland, so they wanted to give the seats a Southern California feel. So the field level seats, they're yellow, and they represent the sun. The loge orange seats represent the sandy beaches. The reserve seafoam green represents the green life and trees of California, and the top deck is blue, where ocean meets the sky. Now, Dodger Stadium, it's symmetrical. You can actually fold the stadium in half. And one of the many great things about Dodger Stadium is there's not a bad seat in the house. And they accomplished this by employing the cantilever theory where every seat in the column-free stadium affords the spectator a completely unobstructed view of the symmetrical playing field. And next, did you know the high five was invented at Dodger Stadium? And no, it wasn't Cody Bellinger who invented the high five. Bruh. It was actually Glenn Burke and it happened during the 1977 season. Now, it was the last series of the year and Steve Garvey, Ron Say, Reggie Smith, and Dusty Baker, they could make history that weekend by becoming the first ever 30 home run quartet in baseball history. Now, three of the four had already reached the 30 home run milestone and all they needed was for Dusty Baker to hit one more home run to reach 30 and he doesn't do it on Friday. He doesn't leave the yard on Saturday and then finally, during the sixth inning on Sunday, he hits his 30th home run of the season and the Dodgers become the first 30 home run quartet in Major League history. And then after Dusty Baker rounded the bases and crossed home plate, he sees rookie Glenn Burke who was waiting on deck. And Burke was so excited for Dusty that he held his hand high in the air and Dusty didn't know what to do, so he just reached up and slapped it and the high five was born. That is how the high five was created at Dodger Stadium and the team, they would use it as a rallying cry for their entire 1977 postseason run. Next, did you know there's a secret Japanese garden at Dodger Stadium? When the stadium first opened, legendary Japanese sports writer Sotaro Suzuki was so impressed by the new stadium that he commissioned a Japanese garden to be built. It's located in the hills past the right field pavilion, and the garden features a wooden bridge, a rock garden, two cherry trees, and a 10-foot-tall, 3,921-pound stone lantern that was given as a token of friendship between the Dodgers and Japan. So if you're looking for some peace and tranquility following a Dodgers loss, head over to the Japanese Garden. Next, did you know there's a time capsule at Dodger Stadium? In 1962, the team buried a time capsule filled with memorabilia from the 1959 World Series and the Dodgers' first ever opening day in 1962. The time capsule is located behind a metal plaque in the top deck. So if the aliens ever invade Los Angeles, they're going to find some really sweet throwback Dodgers gear. Now, if you want to catch a home run, you've got to get seats in the Dodger Stadium Pavilion. Or if you really want to increase your odds of catching a home run, you can sit in the new Dodgers home run seats, which consist of the first two rows that are the closest seating Dodger Stadium has ever had to the outfield wall. But if you want the more affordable option, go with one of the pavilions. And currently it seats over 6,000 fans. But did you know they were actually a last minute addition? Originally, they were going to have a fountain in center field that was going to change colors every time somebody hit a home run. But they did get rid of that idea because they thought it would affect the batter's eye. And while I'm glad they ultimately decided to scrape the fountain idea, you have to admit it would have been a lot of fun to tell Madison Bumgarner to go get it out of the fountain. Now, speaking of home runs, there's plaques at Dodgers Stadium for players that have hit the ball out of the stadium. The first coming on August 5th, 1969, when Pittsburgh Pirates slugger Willie Stargell hit a titanic blast 507 feet over the right field pavilion, setting the record for the longest home run ever hit at Dodger Stadium, a record that still stands today. And then Willie Stargell did it again in 1973, this time a 470-foot bomb that cleared the right field pavilion. And then it happened 
again 24 years later and this time by the only Dodger to hit one out of Dodger Stadium and it was Mike Piazza. Piazza hit a 478 foot blast against the Colorado Rockies so we go from a Piazza party to a Big Mac. Mark McGuire he hit one out of the stadium in 1999. It was a majestic 483 foot blast that went over the left center field pavilion and then it happened most recently in 2015 when Giancarlo Stanton who was with the Marlins at the time hit a 475 foot tank over the left field pavilion. Now, there's been 13 no-hitters pitched at Dodger Stadium, with the last Dodger to do it being Clayton Kershaw in 2014, but the first no-hitter wasn't even a Dodger. It was actually Angels pitcher Bo Belinsky, and it wasn't even against the Dodgers. It was against the Baltimore Orioles, but the Dodgers and the Angels, they did share Dodger Stadium at one point. But there have been 13 no-hitters pitched at Dodger Stadium, and the first one wasn't even a Dodger. The only perfect game in Dodger history was pitched by Sandy Koufax at Dodger Stadium in a 1-0 victory against the Chicago Cubs on September 9th, 1965. Of the seven World Series championships, the only title clinched on their home field was in 1963 when the Dodgers swept the Yankees, capped by a 2-1 victory in Game 4. So the Dodgers have only clinched the World Series at Dodger Stadium once in their franchise's history, but they were the home team in Game 6 of the 2020 World Series when they won the Fall Classic in Arlington, Texas. And next, Pope John Paul II held a mass at Dodger Stadium on September 16th, 1987, during his visit to Los Angeles. Since there wasn't a church big enough to meet the demand of people that wanted to attend the mass, they held it at Dodger Stadium in front of over 63,000 people, which still stands as the record for the largest crowd ever at Dodger Stadium. Now, after the mass, the Pope actually blessed the field at Dodger Stadium. In the following year, they won the 19. 19- 88 World Series. So my question is, why don't we have the Pope hold Mass at Dodger Stadium every year? Now, in addition to the Pope visiting, there's been a countless number of memorable events that have been held at Dodger Stadium. Kiss, the Rolling Stones, the Bee Gees, Michael Jackson moonwalked at Dodger Stadium, David Bowie, U2, Eric Clapton, Bruce Springsteen, the Three Tenors, Beyonce, Bruno Mars. But of all the legendary performances held at Dodger Stadium, nothing will top the Beatles in 1966. The world's most famous band arrived in an armored car for their concert at Dodger Stadium on August 28, 1966. The Sunday evening event was sponsored by radio station KRLA and field box seats cost just $6. Two days later, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, Paul McCartney, and George Harrison performed their final concert together at San Francisco's Candlestick Park. So the Beatles came together for their second to last time at Dodger Stadium and long before Fernando Mania yet Beatle Mania at the Ravine. Other notable non-baseball events at Dodger Stadium include a series of road races that took place in March of 1963. The 1.3 mile course snaked along the perimeter of the parking lot with 12 turns as cars reached top speeds of 120 miles per hour. Wow, that's a lot faster than the one mile per hour I go in the parking lot when I leave the stadium. An international ski show took place there in 1963 with daily shows consisting of two jumping events. Now, unfortunately, Dodger Stadium was the site of a boxing match in March of 1963 that ended in tragedy between boxers Davey Moore and Cuban-Mexican fighter Sugar Ramos. In front of a crowd of 22,000 people, in the 10th round, Ramos staggered Moore with a left and then continued to pummel him with blows until he fell, striking the base of his neck on the bottom rope and injuring his brainstem. Moore got to his feet for the eight count and despite Ramos's continuing attack, managed to finish the round on his feet. But the referee stopped the fight before the 11th and Ramos was declared the new world featherweight champion. Moore was able to give a clear-headed interview before he left the ring, but in the dressing room fell into a coma for which he never emerged. 
Bob Dylan even wrote a song about it titled, Who Killed Davey Moore? The Harlem Globetrotters played an exhibition game at Dodger Stadium on February 4, 1964, with the court placed on the infield. In 1965, legendary Mexican comedian Cantin Flas had a bullfighting show at Dodger Stadium. A soccer match was played there in 2013, and the National Hockey League's first ever regular season outdoor game held in California was played there on January 20th. 25th, 2014 between the Los Angeles Kings and the Anaheim Ducks. A rugby match was played there in 2015 and most recently comedian Gabriel Iglesias, better known as Fluffy, sold out shows at Dodger Stadium. Dodger Stadium has been used as a filming location more times than any stadium in the world combined. With movies like Star Trek and Transformers, The Sandlot, Leslie Nielsen played the only umpire worse than Angel Hernandez in the Naked Gun. The parking lot was used for The Fast and the Furious, Rocket Man, Superman, prevents a plane from crashing into the infield, just to name a few. Now, the Dodgers have set numerous attendance records, and since moving to Los Angeles in 1958, the club has led the National League in attendance 35 times, including posting the highest attendance in the majors 31 of those 35 years. The Dodgers' single-season high came in 2019 when they drew over 3.9 million fans. The largest crowd ever to see a game at Dodger Stadium came on April 13, 2009, when 57,097 fans watched the Dodgers beat the Giants 11-1 to on opening day. In fact, in 2005, the Dodgers were honored by the Guinness Book of World Records as having the highest cumulative attendance for a baseball franchise in history, dating all the way back to 1901. With over 184 million people having attended a Dodger game and over 176 million people having attended a Dodger game at Dodger Stadium. It never rains in Southern California. Since since Dodger Stadium opened in 1962, there have been only 17 rainouts in stadium history, with the last one occurring on April 17, 2000 versus the Houston Trastros. The Dodgers have played 1,756 games at Dodger Stadium without a rainout, which is an all-time club record. But let me know down below in the comment section, what is your favorite fact about Dodger Stadium? Are there some I didn't include in here that I have to include for part two? Let me know down below. My name is Doug McCain. You can follow me at DMAC underscore LA. If you haven't yet, be sure to hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, and as always, think blue, bleed blue, and I'm out.